Okay. Uh, we had, uh, Professor V and I had taken a look at the quiz. What was that for Thursday? Thursday. Yeah, it was Thursday's quiz for September 17th. And uh, for some of you, for the majority of you, it was obviously a very poor performance. So we got in Friday, he and I put our heads together and say, hey, let's go ahead and let them take a second attempt at that quiz. Uh, I don't know how to put it, but they did poorly again. I, I'm kind of, and you guys can uh, intervene and bring up suggestions and bring up ideas. It's kind of like the first one that you guys, and you, you know who, you, who did well and who did not, is, uh, I've heard of some students, well, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a visual learner. Well, I don't know this. Uh, I really don't know how to take notes. So I sent out a video of, you know, how to do good note taking. That went out to you guys. And then uh, I'm kind of head scratching on this, Professor Vermelin. Hold on yeah. one second. Mm -hmm. See that? Yep. Okay. That's the uh, ELW YouTube page. And uh, we have our own channel. And like I said before in text, I would highly encourage you to subscribe to the channel. So uh, you're gonna get a remind notification. That's what we do uh, to let you know it's there. And you're also gonna get a notification when a new video comes up. Well, after all of that poor scoring on that quiz, uh, I decided to go ahead and send out a YouTube video showing you guys of how you can get closed caption on a video and actually how you can get it transcribed so you have notes and you have every word that was said uh, in a text form on that. And what kind of disturbs me right here is this number because six of those views are from people that are within the college. I sent it to some other people. So I sent that link out to you guys and only 12 of you watched it. There's 34 of you. Is somebody having problems or is somebody having, and it's okay if we can solve the problem. Is uh, anybody having a problem getting on YouTube? No. I guess not. Uh, do you just not care to watch them? Sleepy time. Do you think it takes up too much of your time? No, sir. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna show this video. Uh, to be honest with you, after it was all said and done, and I looked at it, every single question that was on the last quiz, well, every single question that's been on every quiz, we've already given you the answers. Uh, all right, well, we'll just go with this one. Uh, good afternoon. Well, this is morning. Yep, 11 7. Good morning, gentlemen. I uh, just want to pass on some information to you today. Uh, this was kind of prompted by Professor Brown and I looking at your quiz scores from the last quiz, which is kind of disturbing. And uh, also looking at uh, the amount of times you guys are looking at the recordings as far as the lecture recordings. I did send a text out there how you guys take notes, but uh, we wanted to show you some kind of cool options there at YouTube that you're able to use to be able to uh, actually get notes from YouTube. So. I want to share a screen here. Professor, be able to see that? Yep, that's all. Okay, good to go. So, uh, what I've done here, and let's, let's just do a, a reload of this page so it gets to you. Okay. When you have an open lecture and you watch the lecture, you've got a couple of options. You can do this closed caption. And you can watch the closed caption words come across the bottom of your screen. 
perhaps a greater amount of reflection we could also cast that so at any that's one option right here. And another kind of nice option that's going on in this process is you get these three dots that's below the video on the right hand side. You can open a transcript of everything that was said inside the uh, meeting. So Google is being nice enough to go ahead and do free transcription. Now, uh, I was toying with a little bit. You can select all of this information and copy and paste it into a Word document and do a search through the Word document if you'd like to. Uh, kind of leave the timestamps in here if you wish. Or I found another option here is probably just a little bit easier. And if you go up to your browser, and in the browser we use, I use Chrome, but all browsers do have this option. You just hit the three dots here and say. Okay, so I went up there into, I hit the transcript on the lower right hand side, so it's showing the transcript on the right. And I went up there to, uh, the options menu in uh, Google Chrome. Uh, Firefox has it, Safari has it, Microsoft Edge has it, Microsoft Internet Explorer has it, they all have it. And I went down here and I just uh, clicked on find. The question has the words in it, uh, magnetic field. I'm gonna hit find. Magnetic field. So starting at the top here at 2723, there, I'm starting to current flows through a conductor. A magnetic field is produced around the conductor. Uh, anytime a conductor is moved through a magnetic field, a voltage is induced. So you're actually able to take the question text and find it in the transcript, and you can either read it through there. There's more. Uh, the rate of change of the magnetic field affects the current also. You can get your answers right here from the transcript, or you can go to the actual spot in the video, 3237. So I can move my slider over here to 3237 and hear it and see it on the video also. So we just wanted to pass that information on to you to let you know that there's a methods here in YouTube that pretty much answer your questions to the test. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it can't get any easier or simpler than that. It, it is. I've tried it on a phone, it seems to work very well on a phone. And uh, I'm on a PC here, it seems to work very well on a PC also. So uh, whatever you hear in the lecture, I do want to pass on to you guys, is historical, so it, it's safe. It's on YouTube all the time. You can see it in word form, as far as closed caption. You can follow it and you'll notice right here, as soon as I click start, it follows it also follows the transcript on the right hand side as it goes down so i just want to pass that information on to you as a resource to be able to uh, assist in your learning and get the uh, tests and quizzes uh, professor v would you like to add anything there yeah i just want to say that this is like he said, it's a, it's a resource just considered to be like a textbook. Um, and really, this is probably going to be a kind of better than a textbook because it has, you know, the, the transcript where the uh, questions are coming from. So utilize um, this tool as much as you can and you um, should be okay. Well, sounds good. With that, we'll just uh, have a say good afternoon. Oh, uh, I'm sure you probably got the text, uh, the quiz that we had last time. We did open it up for a second attempt. And we're going to average the two scores together on that second attempt. So if you got 150, and you guys are going to average out to a 75. So by all means, please take that second attempt. And even if you made an 80 or a 90, we just open it up to everybody. Right. Okay. With that, we're going to go ahead and stop this recording you guys have a good weekend and be safe okay so essentially professor v if, correct me if i'm wrong uh we're notifying all the students of the lectures the transcripts the closed caption we're actually taking notes for them right okay uh, they're able to search those notes in a computer and actually get questions to the answers on the quizzes correct Right. I, I'm not giving any quiz questions 
that I haven't spoken about. Is that right? Great. All right. So can you, and I'll ask you, Professor B, why isn't everybody getting 100? I don't know, sir. Uh, they're not utilizing the video, I guess. Thank you very much. It's, it's obvious. Gentlemen, we're not going to pass information on to you just to be texting. Uh, when we send something to you, it's important. <laughs> and I, to be honest with if we were sitting in a classroom, you guys would have to get a notebook out and you'd have to do this by hand. Uh, the online learning environment, if you're disciplined to stay awake and go through the entire class, uh, you know, I don't want to do a whole class for a whole day in, in Zoom or anything like that. That's why I try to keep it down to a couple hours. You got it made. Yeah. You got it made. Everything's done for you. All you got to do is use those resources. So uh, I went through those test scores, and uh, you gentlemen that watched the video and used that resource, and I think I saw some 60s that turned into hundreds. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Uh, good score. You, you now got a 160 and a half of that's an A, B. Uh, you people that got 50 and then another 50, that's an F. I'm not going to, we handed it out twice and gave you the way to find, get the answer. So uh, I'm kind of just head scratches. I'm a little bit upset about it, as you can tell by the tone of my voice. Yep. We're teaching a class. We're giving you the answer to quizzes. It's up to you guys to get the ball together. Uh, before we take a break here, it's going to come down to the day where I'm going to have, and we'll just say Professor Vermlin and I are students in the class. He and I are going to walk into an interview and they're going to say, man, I want to hire a shoemaker. And the other guy is going to say, man, I want to hire a vermin. And, it's, we, you know, we're just going to be neck and neck in, comp in comparison. Well, shoot, I'm going to go get shoemakers transcripts from where Georgetown Tech. Attendance. Mediocre. Was late to class sometimes. Sometimes he was off. Grades. Well, you know, he's got an F here and there. Vermilion, to class, on time every time, excellent attendance, he's showing A's. Who do you think they're gonna hire? Professor Vermilion. You guys that need to stay on the ball, I, I can't say it and stress it anymore. I want you to all, and it's easy to do, to walk out with A's. I think you kinda <clears throat> you speculate, I'm in college, can I actually get that summa cum laude and, you know, all those magna cum laude accolades, absolutely, students have done it before. They've walked down, they've got all those accolades coming in with their certificate. So I want you guys to get the same thing, too. Okay, with that, let's take, uh, what time is it? Uh, 9.42. Let's take about, uh, we'll be back at 9.55. Take a break. You know, just to wrap it up there, I uh, don't know if everybody came left and came back to the video here. Uh, we've got some options. Professor V and I got some options out there that we can use. And if we see another instance of where, you know, test scores are going down or people are not watching the resources or using the resources that we make available to you, uh, those, those options are that we'll just make everybody go video. So everybody's got to show their face while they're in the classroom which if you show your face now, uh, I've got no problem with it. Uh, two is we can go to what they call the lockdown browser. We have that option of doing that. And uh, when, it, when you start taking your quiz, you're not able to take uh, and move away from that quiz and that browser or go anywhere else until that quiz is complete. And we give two hours, well, we give more than two hours. We give 10 hours to be able to do that. So lockdown browser, we have that option. Uh, and the other one is to proctor the test and have you guys take the test in the uh, testing center. What's up there, Justin? Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just messing with stuff. Okay, that's okay. So take your hand down. So we'll call on you again. So <laughs> we'll, we'll make you guys uh, have to report to the college and just take the uh, quizzes and tests and exams in the testing center. When you get in the testing center, uh, you're going to be on a computer that uh, has no access to the internet. It only has access to the uh, school network. And uh, you're able to get on D2L and that's it. No phones are allowed. So if you want to make it 
tough, we, we can oblige you. I just want to comment. I wish, I wish school was this easy when I was younger. I really do. <laughs> you, well, you make it easy, as easy as you want it to. I yeah, mean, it's crazy. It, it's kind of uh, one of those things. Well, prof the, I've never seen a college that where the professor gives you the answers. Well, yeah, I know. It's mad. You know, it, it's kind of one of those things. The it, it's there. Are you learning, Paul? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, are you learning something new? Are you learning what electrical line is all about? That's the yeah. process that we come. A test, a quiz is not given for you to get a poor grade on. I hate when I see them. A test is to make sure that we are up to speed and we're able to carry on further in business and get down the road with more stuff. That that's that's the way I view a test. I don't want to give you a poor grade. Now, you're going to find professors in other colleges that won't sit down and talk with you like this. I know it's kind of a little bit of a daddy talk and you'll find professors in colleges that will just watch you get F after F after F after F and not give you the option to even make that test up. They're just going to let you go. I, I don't, I don't like to operate like that. So as, as obvious you can see, neither, neither does professor Vermlin. We want you guys to be uh, very good at what you do. And, you know, I, I thought about it when I went outside and smoked my cigarette outside. I said, you know, if you want to go through a course and get C's, it's kind of, it's going to filter right into where your employer, whoever you get employed with, yep, he's, he's a C student and he's going to be a C lineman <laughs> forever, yeah. you right. know, or he's a B student or he's an A student, you know, they're going to be an A and that's what they want you to be. And eventually a supervisor. Yeah. So, uh, if there's no other comments on that, gentlemen, uh, like I said, when we started this course, we're going to tighten the belt. ELW-110 was kind of easy. ELW-111 is a little bit tougher. And I mean all around. Attendance, being late, getting good grades. The belt is tightening, and it's going to tighten even more if you want it to be. You make your life as easy as you want to. Okay, so let's jump into the book. We'll do a little bit of re review here as far as the uh, what we had spoken about last week. And we really got into uh, magnetic induction. And I'm on page 91 of the book. We got into magnetic induction and what it is and how a conductor is going to have magnetic, a magnetic field around it. One, it's got to have amperage on the conductor and the intensity of the amperage. So if I have more amperage on a conductor, the larger the magnetic field is. And if I have lower, the lesser it is. Obviously, if you have amperage on a conductor, you gotta have voltage also. When we talk voltage, we'll get into later of an electrostatic field. Yes, sir, Mr. Justin. What page are we on? 91. That's the bottom of 91. And I'm getting ready to turn to 92. Actually, 93. You will, ask, you will see, and I'm not worried about the left-hand, right-hand rule right now because we are working with AC electricity. Those fields change, actually. They go back and forth. I am at the uh, second paragraph of 93. The basic law in reverse is the principle magnetic induction, which states whenever a conductor cuts through a magnetic lines of flux, a voltage is induced in the conductor. <clears throat> That's in the figure in the bottom of page 93, where you see figure 4-15. You'll see that they're moving the conductor, and that's just a magnet. That's all it is. They're moving a conductor back and forth through that magnetic field. And once that happens, we're going to have voltage induced onto that conductor. Now, we've spoken before, you got to have movement. And in the real world, where we're having transformers, where we have... Uh, substation transformers or pole mount transformers or even generators when we're doing generation at our generating station we're having mechanical movement at the generating station we're taking a turbine we're turning a generator okay and that generator is going through a magnetic field that produces voltage in a transformer we don't have that kind of movement we don't have a mechanical movement what kind of movement are we using in a transformer to be able to produce electricity in a, in a transformer actually to convert it 
from 7,200 to 240? What movement are we using? The AC waves. The AC wave, correct. Uh, great job, Benjamin. The AC wave moves one direction and the other direction. One direction and the other direction. That's the movement. It's kind of like if you want to call it a pseudo movement. There's nothing mechanical that's happening, but the magnetic field is changing back and forth how many times per second? Be careful when you answer this one. 60 times. Be careful. 60 times a second. Okay, that's for one full wave. How many times does it go this way? And how many times does it go that way? Two times in a second. Two times in a second? If there are 60 per second, oh, no. and one of these makes a full wave, is 60 oh. times? 120. 120. Okay, so 120 times per second, direction is changed. Okay? So that's your movement per second of how many times that's changed. That's where we're getting our movement from to produce voltage. And especially transform voltage. Okay. Rise in time and current, the exponential curve, you don't need to do about that. Okay, I've moved over to page 104, inductance. Inductance is measured in units called Henry and is represented by the letter L. A coil has an inductance of one Henry when a current charge change of one ampere per second results in an induced voltage of one volt. What they're really, and I, you don't need to know the math on the next page. What they're really wanting to point to is the figure 4-32 at the bottom of page 105. The more coils I have, the greater magnetic field or the more inductance that I have. So you'll see on the left hand figure, the turns in that coil of wire has less inductance and more turns has more inductance. So it's gonna create a greater magnetic field. Now has the voltage changed? Mm -hmm. If I introduce 120 volts in that conductor, does the voltage change? No. No? Does the amperes change? Um. If I'm asking for one amp and I'm using one amp, are the amps gonna change? No. No, they're not gonna change. If I introduce more coils at 120 volts and one amp, my magnetic field is gonna change because I have created a greater size or intensity magnetic field with the introduction of more coils. This is basically, I mean, the bottom level of how a transformer works. I create a magnetic field on one side, that magnetic field cuts across the coils on the other side, and that is the basic principle of transformation. If you remember in the math part, when we spoke a little bit before, we spoke about the ratio of one to 30. Yeah, we spoke that that ratio applies also to the amount of coils that are in a transformer. So if I want to reduce my voltage from 7,200 7, volts to 240 volts or 120 volts, all I have to do is reduce the amount of coils or the size of my magnetic field to be able to produce that voltage. This is basic bottom level. Okay, I'm on page 106, core material. When a coil is wound around a non-magnetic material such as wood or plastic, it is known as an air core magnet. When a coil is wound around a magnetic material such as iron or soft steel, it is known as an iron core magnet. In addition to magnetic material to the center of the coil can greatly increase the strength of the magnet. So now they're moving, I don't want to say they're moving away, a regular air coil, if you'll see the figure on page 4-33 of 100 flux lines coming out of each end. And that's where the magnetic field, remember in a magnet, the intensity comes out each end. That's where it's most intense. When I wrap 
that same amount of turns on a coil around a, a ferrous material or a iron core, iron or steel core, it actually intensifies the amount of magnetic field that I have. So I can reduce the amount of turns and put them on a magnetic core and really intensify my, my magnetic field. You see 100 flux lines on an air core on the left, figure 4-33, and 1,000 flux lines on the right, I'm intensifying my magnetic force or field just because I put it around a core. Now, you got to remember in this also, when I'm doing these windings around a, a, a ferrous or metallic type core, it's insulated. The, has anybody ever heard of Litz wire before? Mm -hmm. so. What well, well, your definition there, Paul? No, I said no, no sir. So you have not? Okay. Litz wire, if you look at it, it looks just like a copper winding, but it has a small covering on it, and usually it's a lacquer or plastic type cover that's really thin that insulates it from, this, from the core. So it's not making contact with the core, and they're doing that well in that picture right there. There's no physical contact going on between the wire themselves, from wire to wire, and there's no contact being made with the core itself but the electromagnetic field being produced is induced onto it. That's why they called it magnetic induction. What would, it, what would an example of an air core be like in wood and plastic? Like what, well, how would that happen? I'll give you an example here. Let me get to my Microsoft Paint. Uh, and uh, Professor V? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can find this. If you can do a little investigation there about a bucket truck and grounding it and how you're supposed to uncoil the ground or anything of that nature. Let's see where you go on. Okay, so I will get in here in Microsoft Paint. Good question, because it does relate fully to what we're talking about here. It says non-magnetic non materials such as wood. Like, why, why would you coil something around wood? Uh, they're, they're using that as an example, but I will, and I'm going to show you a couple of things here in paint. I get everything squared away on my screen. That we actually had some general work practices here. Okay, are you able to see my paint screen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, back in the days, and this was just a general work practice here because it made us made it easier on our, on our jobs and whatnot. And I, I know we haven't talked too much about this, but we would install a switch on a cross arm. Hey, Shoemaker, did yes, you yes. mean for your... Uh screen to be like one thin line one yeah that's all i see one thin line that's yeah it's like a thin white line down the middle of the screen no i did not hold on let me stop share here move some stuff around thank you for letting me know let's go paint How about now? That's good. Good. That's better. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate you letting me know. Get out of the way. All right. So you'd have a cross arm and a switch mounted on a cross arm. And uh, here's the fuse that's inside the switch right here. And then you have your wire going down to your transformer like this. Uh, I know it's a small transformer. Well, this wire comes up, and you'll see in our construction build because we're going to be doing some of these today. This wire cut comes up and makes contact with the primary wire, so you're able to get primary voltage down to the transformer, just like that. Well, Paul and others, our general practice was back in the day, we would take this switch, and I'll do another one right here, and it was just because, for one, ease of use. Here's my wire out of the bottom. We would take this wire out of the top of the switch and we would coil it. 
like this, and then put it to the primary conductor. So if any, during the course of time, if you had something where maybe this broke or burned up, one, you had some slack in it, and two, it was very, very easy to uh, maneuver and shape, okay? You could stretch it out. It, it just kind of made things easier on the lineman when he had a little bit, he knew he had a little bit extra, one, and you could shape this and put it in a position where it's not gonna flop around or anything like that. This one gets kind of floppy if you do it incorrectly. Well, the engineers came back to us and said, no, don't do that anymore. Any, any reasons that you guys can think of? It get caught. They create a magnetic field. Exactly, exactly. It creates a magnetic field, all right? Whenever you coil a piece of wire like this and it has a uh, voltage, one, it creates a magnetic field. Two, once that magnetic uh, field is created, it intensifies voltage. You're, act you're actually making Okay, you're actually making your own kind of mini transformer right here. And it's, it's not really noticeable at 7,200 volts, but this is giving a mag off a magnetic field to everything that's around it once you make a coil in it. Where it came in at 7,200 volts really wasn't a problem. Where the problem occurred was if you got a lightning strike, bang. Now, if you created a lightning, a lightning strike, hit the line, and went down this coil, and we're talking millions of volts, and it hit this coil right here, the lightning arrestor or anything attached to it now is going to pretty much get destroyed because you have intensified the voltage with that coil. That's where the problem came in. So that gives you an idea, Paul. When they use you know, plastic and uh, wood type materials as far as the coil is concerned, they really don't wanna create a large magnetic field and they don't wanna produce a increase in the magnetic field that's being created. Uh, you, you're not gonna see very many of those whatsoever. You're either gonna go one, one or two directions. One, I don't wanna create any field at all. This is bad. I don't wanna do this anymore or two, I want to create a great magnetic field through some kind of type of metallic core material. Is that only the case with uh, non-insulated wire? That's in the case of all wire. Even if you were to take uh, like street light wire or number 12, you take number 12 in a house and you go through that house and at a certain location, you put four, five, 10, 20 coils in it and then continue on, right? You're creating a magnetic field in that coil of wire, even though it's insulated. And it will get spikes in voltage because you've introduced that coil into it. Because I know everything we do, we always leave a good bit of slack. That way if we have to work on it, it's a quick fix. Slack is fine. If you leave slack in this nature, it's fine. Or you come up to the end of a, say you've got a switch box and you're coming into that switch box and you're going way up high and coming straight in low. So you can use all of this space through here for slack, it's fine. Coiling it though, is not a good practice. <laughs> Professor V, have you ever been able to find anything? I have not. I know there's videos out there. I've seen them, but I can't find them. All right. I can draw it right here. Yeah. You will have uh, in cases where, and we'll show videos later on of certain equipment that you're going to use. And I'm going to use a bucket truck here. Even though I probably can't draw a good bucket truck. Mm, I don't know. Front tires, back tires. The guy is up in the air in the boom, in the bucket truck. Every time that you use a truck that's got something elevated in the air, you're going to have to ground the chassis of the fleet. And all fleets have come with a coil of grounding cable. Now, Professor V, keep me straight. 
Some companies make you go to a screw down rod, which you're manually going to put in the ground. Right. Or some companies will go to the pole ground. There's actually a ground that's going down the pole and attached to that. Some companies will carry it all the way up to the neutral. Our practice was you put a screw down, it's a manually, it's got a, it's like a T-bar. It's got a cork screw at the end and you just screw this down to the earth and you attach your ground to it right there. What's, what was your practice? We had a safety rule um, that said um, the system common neutral should always be used when available. When not available, we'd go to the screw down ground behind the truck. Okay. It's mandatory, gentlemen, that when you take, and this thing is coiled up in the, either in the bed of the truck or sometimes you have a little tray or bin at the bottom of the truck right here, that when you take this out, you just don't take it out for the certain amount of feet. Say you got to go four or five, six feet and attach it and leave the coil in the truck. You've got to stretch it completely out on the ground and come back and attach it then to the ground rod. You cannot leave it in the coil either on the ground or on the truck. Well, what's the reason? It's not going to ground. It won't ground. It will ground. But if you have any kind of contact with the boom right here, this ground is rated, is, on, is rated you know, pretty well. You introduce the coil into it, it's gonna intensify the voltage and the magnetic field. And sometimes, you, I've seen it happen once, you'll just blow the connector right off the ground rod because you intensified the voltage that came from contact. If you had stretched it out, and not created that magnetic field and the coil itself, which intensifies two things, the voltage and the magnetic field, that wouldn't have happened. So that's a good example of an air coil right there that's not good in use of practice. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so let me unshare here. How often did you run into something that this magnetic field actually relates to while you were doing like distribution? Distribution? Do you remember that video I showed you of the guy that was in the bucket truck and he was grounding the transmission line? Yeah. That's often. And what's, uh, uh, let me get back to share. That's a, you guys are bringing up great examples right here. Hold on one second. I'll draw it in. I'm not going to bring up that video again. You see my screen back? Yep. All right. Here's a great example, guys, and you'll be able to see it when we go out to the field there on 501. I'm going to draw it like I'm looking down the line. You got one phase, one phase, one phase. Here's my pole right here through the center. Okay, and I uh, can't remember this. I'm cross arms or post insulators. Put it on post. Under that, this is a 34 kV. Under that, we have a phase, two, three phases, and this is distribution 12,470. All right, and then we have our regular transformer, whatever we're going to have down here. And switch. On the other side over here, and this is big, this is actually true to sight. We've got one, two, three. That's 115 kV. 12,470, 34, 115. Okay, and actually over here, this is the right away at the college. We've got another circuit. Oh, 12,470. All right. Now, the question has come up before, well, am I having magnetic induction now from these sets of lines? Is magnetic induction happening? Let me back that up. 
is each one of these phases making a magnetic field. It's energized and it has amperage on it. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. But if these are all energized all also, guess what they're doing? The same thing. They're doing the same thing. So that, it's called bucking. They're, they're actually not getting any induced voltage because they're creating their own magnetic field, which is forcing the other magnetic field away. Same on these conductors down here. So there's no magnetic induction going on. Magnetic fields are, it's just not being induced into another conductor. Oh, Let's because they're, they're like competing against each other almost? They're, they're pushing yeah. against each other, right? Oh, really? Yeah, and even, even if you have one amp on here and 9,000 on here, you still got the push that's going out. It's not being induced into the other conductor. What happens out there in the real world and this is something to look out for when you work. Let me see if I can, uh, I'll just draw arrows to it. Well, I'll change my color. Is if I go to this circuit right here and I de-energize all three of these conductors, all right, are they making a magnetic field anymore? No. No. Are they getting induced voltage from all the other conductors that are around it. Yes. Yes, everywhere. The 115 line is inducing on it, the 34 line is inducing on it, and this line is inducing on it also. This is the simple concept, gentlemen. If I have a wire, and I'll just do straight line. If I have wire that's got volts and amps on it, it's creating a magnetic field. If I have a wire that's de-energized down here at the bottom, what's going to happen? It's going to energize. Those magnetic fields are going to cut across the line that I have energized. The movement is AC. So it's these magnetic lines of flux are moving back and forth. There's my movement. You've just created in this situation right here a transformer. I've got a high voltage on the top. Now I'm going to have a lower voltage, even though it's going to be substantial on the bottom. That's what was happening with that guy in the bucket truck. He was grounding this line or something similar to it in the video. Everything around him was de-energized. He was grounding this line and he was actually picking up voltage. Well, where was the voltage coming from? The other lines. Magnetic induction. Hey, question real quick. Yes, sir. The lines that we're putting up, are we going to create anything based from the lines that are already uh, operational that we, work 501? We have sufficient distance. Now, you bring up something, okay. you bring up something that we did run into. Uh, we moved far enough away. If you remember my yard out there at the field, and we had, uh, we got the transmission line that goes like this, over on the, that side that goes to the substation, and we've got all this distribution line, lines like this. We at one time went out to the field for a learning lesson, and we put a line here, and this is closer to Highway 501. Put a line here, here, and here, and here. And I had a guy that went up and said, you know, I'm starting to feel a little buzz off this wire right here. I can feel it on my arms. Well, what was happening? It was, um, it was starting to get the sensation of magnetic induction from that transmission line over there. So yeah. as soon as that happened, we took a ground rod and we put a ground rod right down here and we grounded all the lines in the circuit. And then from that point on, we moved everything that way. So yeah, it has happened at the field. But we've cured it. A, a substation is like behind the college there. Yeah, that's the one right. that's not down here near Technology Drive. That's right. Here's the parking lot down here. So one, we came in proximity. And two is, if you'll notice, every time I've drawn, even when I've drawn the coils, they're opposing each other. See how this faces the other one? All right, same thing's going to happen in your power lines. If I got a power line going like this, even though it might be uh, 
you're still going to get induction. These magnetic lines, where can they cut across this conductor? Where at? Only there. And until the magnetic line, uh, magnetic field eventually goes away. If I put a line side by side, where can it cut? Through the entire section of line. And you got to remember some of these transmission distribution lines are miles long. So the exposure is much greater when you have a line like this side by side and they're going parallel with each other. Good questions, and it really does give a good explanation of the magnetic field. Okay. What time are we holding there, Professor B? Uh, 1031. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm on page, uh, Professor V, when do we need to give out the project? Um, it's coming up real close. Um, you start talking about generation? Yeah, generation and uh, generation to meter. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's do that then. Um, this, jumps, this jumps into series and parallel circuits. We're through with magnetic induction in the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's go ahead and take, gentlemen, just take about 10 and come back and we've got a project for you guys to start working on it and uh, we'll give you the instructions to what it is. All right, be right back, 10 minutes.